Hey everyone, Freak here. Patch 9.14 is upon us and it is a gigantic patch with a boatload of changes. And for my sanity and yours, we're probably going to go a little bit quicker on some of these segments. If you want a TLDR, there will be a link in the description below to when that begins. And if you would rather look at a TFT patch notes rundown, that will be in a separate video. I'll have a link to that in the description as well when it's uploaded. Um, otherwise, let's get into it because holy moly, big freaking patch. Okay, 9.14, yeah. Uh, well, first things first. Blitzcrank and Renekton now destroy shields. Blitz, it's on his ultimate. Renekton's on his empowered W, which means these are not very reliable tools. Uh, this is only post level 6 on a support, which means it takes a while. Renekton empowered W, certainly doable, of course, but it's not always available 100% of the time. Um, what I will say, though, is I think this is actually a good change because League of Legends is a mature game. It's been out for like 10 years at this point. Uh, you're no longer, you know, having 99% of your players on blind pick. I think it's okay to have some level of counter picking, some level of counters in a mature game like this. I think that's fine. Uh, it will obviously create some matchups that will be very, very tough, but I think that is okay. Um, next up is the same thing for anti-healing. Katarina Ult has healing reduction back. Um, well, sorry, increased. Uh, Kled now has it as well. Again, I think this stuff is kind of cool. Um... Small power for those champions. Fizz and Leona have flat damage reduction, which makes them good against on-hit champions. You have things like Wit's End or Rage Blade. It's good against dot mages like Brand Passive and Malzahar E. Um, this is actually quite interesting, I think. Um, this is generally going to be power up for these champions. Uh, looking over at um, uh, Fizz Pass, for example. Now, to match the auto attack damage difference, you're not going to get there. It's just not going to happen. These are not realistic AP values for Fizz, but it's going to block 32 damage off of a Malzahar E. Okay, the base damage is like 80, and at rank 5, it's like 200-something. Um, so it's only so much, but it exists. And as you get more ability power, that 32 damage off becomes 64 damage off, becomes 100 damage off, and suddenly... Your passive being remove 100 damage from Malzi e in, to be fair, late game, 600 AP is late game. That's still really good. So I think it's kind of cool. I think it's kind of cool. Uh, I'm excited to see what comes out of this. Uh, Leona doing similar things, losing 5 to 25 armor, 0 to 20 magic resist. Um, here's the difference there because, of course, she already has armor and MR. And, in fact, these abilities scale as she buys more of it. So um, this... This will never be this impactful in the real world, but, you know, up to 10% more damage taken, roughly. Um, I would generally say that this is going to do more than that, right? Because at rank 1, you don't think you ever take more than 80 damage per tag. And at, at high ranks, you very rarely take more than 240 damage per tag. Um, outside of auto attacks that crit and really big mage spells. Uh, now, that can happen in those cases, you know, when Vagar's run around throwing W and R down with 900 ability power. Yeah, this is weaker there. But in a lot of other cases, though, she's going to be really, 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 really good against Kaisa Q. Really good against Kaisa Q. Um, so, there you go. That's going to be interesting to me. I'm... I'm uh, it'll be good against Zyra plants. It'll be good against uh, things like Comet and and Airy. Everything with separate little triggers of damage. All getting reduced. I think it's cool. All right. Um, next up is uh, additions to True Sight Reveal. I know last time I talked about stealth on this uh, sort of YouTube series, I kind of thought that I think it would actually be better if true stealth could remain true stealth and turrets broke it, but champions couldn't, and you balanced it around that. I still think that's worth trying out, but at the end of the day, we're instead going the other way with consistency, where once you start revealing, the ability that reveals will continue to reveal during the crowd control. So Karma W, LeBlanc E, and Morgana R all continue their reveal once the CC lands. I think, regardless of what I said before about, like, hey, let's remove all of it, I think this is good for consistency. That... If it does it in the first half, it gets corrected it does it in the second half. So that's a good thing, in my opinion. Um, and, of course, makes them better against champions like Akali and Shaco and all the other stealth champions. Uh, and then, finally, we have anti-mobility getting buffed. This is one of the things that I see Reddit complain about all the time. Oh, look how fast these units move. Look how much movement they have. So Charm is back to canceling in-progress dashes. 
which makes her, I guess, good into LeBlanc. If LeBlanc Ws at you, you can stop her mid-cast, and, you know, she won't land the W damage on you. And Cassiopeia W, um, Nilligar has a minimum cast range so that she can just sit that down right on LeBlanc or Zed or whomever and make their lives miserable. I think that's kind of interesting. Max cast range goes down, cooldown goes up, a bunch of things change. Okay, so let's go into the actual Cassiopeia changes, because there's health, mana, and armor changes. Here's the health and armor stuff. Here's the health before and after. It's because of 2100, which is quite high. Uh, it's actually quite high overall. Armor actually was cut down a little bit. Uh, she's now more like a regular ranged champion in armor, but has very, very high HP. This ends up making Cassiopeia better against mages, worse against physical assassins. Now, the weird thing is physical assassins like to dash, and she's now good against dashes. So did it really change? Maybe she's bad into Varus and Jace. Um, either way, um, she's actually still overall more durable against physical damage. The armor nerf is not enough to make it for the health nerf, or the health buff, I should say. She's much, much more durable against mages. Uh, quite substantially so. Then she gets some mana changes. Uh, weaker in the first five levels, not a big deal. Far better in the high levels. Um, in my opinion, by the way, I actually wish this could happen at some point in League of Legends for um, base stat consistency. Every champion should reach 1,000 mana at level 18. And, like, plus or minus 25 based on, like, other needs. But, like, more than 900, less than 1,100, no exceptions. Uh, the reason I think that is I like when you can look at a resource bar and go, oh, I'm pretty sure I know how big that is. I think that is valuable. Personally, I think it's quite valuable. Um, and so Cassiopeia uh, and every other mage and every other champion just scaling up to 1,000 max mana. Um, helps you understand how big a resource bar is, and also it makes uh, things like Mana Mune and Seraph's Embrace uh, more consistent. Um, I'm sure there's plenty of champions out there that, that have liked to use Mana Mune, but like their base mana is 600, so their scaling is really bad on it. They're missing out on a bunch of ability power. I think that probably exists to a certain degree. Um, it also means Rod of Ages is bad, because you don't have expensive mana costs or a big mana pool to get health back. And I think there's a bunch of, like, underlying this champion sucks for a weird reason, um, or is suboptimal in a weird way for a weird reason, that I think a um, more flattened mana curve would help. That's its own thing, whatever. Here's the W cooldown. I looked up uh, most common Cassiopeia builds today, and they are um, W max last. That probably changes with this, but I just decided to throw this in there as, as similar stuff. Um, do want to point out that you really need to get to, like, um, rank 4 the ability till this is a buff at all because 18 is, is the first rank of the cooldown so um, but hey if you keep going you get a really absurd mana cost so you know maybe W max second comes in we'll see and the next up is twin fang uh, doesn't heal for much against minions and monsters um, the heal is actually now based purely on your AP ratio and the cast is the, the cost rather is flattened um, so instead of the heal being based on champion level, it's purely AP ratio, which is based on level. Um, and the rank up doesn't have a mana cost downside, but you don't heal off minions as much. Okay, here is this. Here is how much AP it takes you to equal the old healing. And this, by the way, is counting the old 0.1 AP ratio in this math. Uh, this is a, this is done correctly, the math, I'm pretty sure. Um, just double checking one thing real quick. Two, three, four, five. Okay, yeah, whatever. Um, yeah. So here's basically your numbers. Uh, to be fair, I didn't know exactly what levels the AP ratio changed at. I guessed, maybe I'm slightly wrong, but whatever. Um, it, this might be more of a buff than it looks like on paper. I'm guessing it's actually more generous than what I wrote down here, but I had to pick something. Um, as far as the cost is concerned, assuming you did, in fact, max E first, which is her most common skill build. Um, this basically does a lot to really, really nerf rank 1 E, right? She has less mana. Her E heals less, her E costs more. Early laning got slaughtered here. Well, not slaughtered, but but hit in three different places. Um, she gained other power back in other places, especially stuff like this. But hey, FYI, that exists. Cassipi is going to be more of a late game mage, less of an early game one. Poppy's also good against movement. Now when she stops your dash, she uh, grounds you for two seconds and slows you for two seconds. That seems pretty cool. Uh, the, the cage is up for less time, though. So, again, sort of tighter windows, I think, is generally positive. That's a cool thing. All right, next up is Aatrox. Aatrox has more health regen, and the ultimate no longer revives ever, but has more self-healing and a better cooldown. So here's the health regen before and after. It was very, very, very low at early ranks. It kind of still is, but he's got a passive, so who cares? Uh, scales up pretty decently. This is actually pretty solid health regen by endgame. 
Here's the R healing. It's up by quite a bit in the early game. Cooldown up by quite a bit, uh, or better by quite a bit as well. Um, so yeah, I mean, these are all strict buffs, aside from the fact that very clearly you no longer revive. Um, watching pro games, I saw Aatrox revive maybe once or twice a game. Solo queue is going to be different, don't get me wrong, but like... This doesn't affect Pro that much, honestly. I know the goal is to try to, I think, um, get him into a balanced state for Solo Q and Pro as well. My understanding is Solo Q win range is low, his Pro presence is high. I'm actually not sure the revive is actually what makes that difference. It actually might push further. We'll see, though. We'll see what happens. Uh, next up, major updates to Akali. Significantly upgraded magic resist, a lot more health growth. Um, AP ratio is going up on Q, AP ratio going up on E. Our cooldown getting worse. A lot of changes here. Okay. So basically what it comes down to is here is Aatrox's new health. It is up to 9% more HP. This is quite high. 265 is quite high for HP. Her MR going up by about 5 puts her here. So a lot tankier and especially against magic damage dealers. So she's being pushed towards being an anti-mage. Um, okay, sure, that's fine. Um, she's losing Twilight Shroud Obscurity though. It is now regular invisibility. She is revealed by true side effects like LeBlanc, like Karma, like Morgana, like Lee Sin. That is, of course, a pretty big deal. Now, turrets already did this, so this really only matters when certain champions exist in the game. This does not change anything if you are not against a true sight revealing champion. So there's going to be a lot of cases where this literally doesn't change a thing. I want to be very clear about that. This is a situational nerf to the character. Um, other things to worry about or care about here is that the W is no longer extended in duration by hopping out and in. You just get the rank duration flatly in and of itself. You do get the max energy restore at one point, though, and the cooldown is flattened as well. I want to point out, though, that the cooldown... I could have sworn I saw something about this. Maybe I'm trolling. So excuse me if I'm wrong about this. I could have sworn I saw a note in the patch notes before this came out, but like in the internal patch notes, that the cooldown started on cast, not on W ending. Now that could be wrong, but I did my math assuming that was true. So this could very, very much be wrong. Regardless, the cooldown is obviously in all cases um, well, not in all cases shorter. So this was assuming you extended your duration a whole bunch, right? Because the old cooldown was 25 to 13, but was extended by up to 9 seconds based on W rank um, by hopping in and out of the shroud or attacking or whatever, which meant the actual cooldown was between 32 and 22. Um, the cooldown is now 20 seconds. Now, it still might be like 24 to 26 based on rank and I'm a silly billy. That's a possibility here. Regardless, the cooldown is in most cases, quite a bit faster. Again, also, you're maxing at last, so the rank 1 cooldown is definitely a lot faster. The energy restore is obviously flattened as well, right? So keep in mind, the cooldown is flattened, the energy restore is flattened. There is only a half-second stealth duration is the only rank of incentive on W now, which means you are not ranking up W anymore. Do not rank up W. It's a one-point wonder. Um, and here's the old duration, here's the new duration, right? 5 to 7 based on rank. It used to uh, extend by up to 2 seconds based on getting in and out of the shroud, which is what was going to be added in before. So I might have removed this from the cooldown incorrectly, but I could have sworn that's what was said before. Regardless, whatever, it's pretty close. Okay, so you're not going to rank W anymore. Instead, you're going to rank E. And E has a lower AD ratio by half. Um, it goes from, I think it's, instead of a 1.4, it's a 0.7. To be fair, the only attack item, attack damage item she ever bought was a gun blade, so that's it. You never bought more attack damage past that. Instead, there's a 1.0 AP ratio, which is going to do a lot more heavy lifting over the course of the game. So, I mean, this thing right here is a buff. The AD ratio to AP is a buff. Um, but what the big change was, is now that you're maxing E second, you're going to do a lot more damage with your E, but E has a total attack damage ratio, which means it scales with character level. So the old E would be maxed last, and here's the damage on both halves of E, quite high, of course. Now E is going to be maxed second, and you have this. You have this incredibly increased damage. Now rank 1 of the ability is almost the same, and rank 5 of the ability at level 18 is almost the same. 
And this is counting the reduced AD ratio, by the way. So, you know, this is it, it does 23 more damage level 18 before Gunblade, and then Gunblade, it gets close, right? Um, and there's an AP ratio on top. But your mid game has way the hell more damage. At level 13, when it's 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 as egregious as it could be, it does triple the damage it used to. So Akali E is now a very real damage tool, partially because you're putting points into it and because it has a real AP ratio. So this thing is going to scale and you're going to care about it. This is going to be really, 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 really relevant. Also worth pointing out that um, more of the damage has been backloaded. Right before Shuriken did more than dash. Uh, now it's identical. So um, you need to land the second half. You need to land the second half more often. Okay. Uh, and then 20 seconds up on the R cooldown. I believe I didn't actually put down, so whatever. But it's 20 seconds on the R cooldown. Ultimately, really huge changes. Much more damage, much less stealth, um, but higher AP ratios, higher durability, right? She is, um, I mean, a little bit less tricky, definitely tankier, and more damaging. And you can escape less with R, which is a good change. Alistair gets some mana. Here you go, buddy. 25 to 11%. Congratulations. Look at that beautiful 1030. Next up, big changes to Aurelian Soul. Okay, so the maximum stun duration, which is after 5 seconds, is up substantially. It's up 33%. That's a really, really big buff in stun duration. Now, of course, the uh, minimum stun is still this. That didn't change, but anywhere between the minimum stun and the max stun is going to grow towards that one-third more stun duration, so that's pretty big. Um, your E movement speed is now scaling with character rank. Now, I do want to point out one thing that I don't have here in this because this whole patch note thing was so big, I didn't do all the... I didn't do perfect math for everything. Um, proper Aurelian Soul play dictates that you put a second point in E at level 8. Um, or potentially even earlier. Uh, because the second point in E is a very, very big difference in how far your E travels you. So in the real world, um, this hits 30% right here, not there. Uh, but even in that case, it's already at 33% by this point, so uh, it's still a strict buff in all cases. So Aurelian Soul simply has more out-of-combat move speed. Congratulations, Aurelian Soul, and more stunning. Those are really nice buffs. Bard gets more health and less regen, and also has a flattened E rank up incentive. Um, so here's the health versus the regen. Um, I didn't actually look at how long it would take to make up the health difference, uh, but if he has 40 more health and he gets 24 less health per minute, Takes about a minute and a half. There you go. That's what it takes. Uh, which means in extended landing phases where you're getting poked, you will actually get worn down. Um, thankfully, he has a W that you're now going to max second because Magical Journey is definitely getting a one-point wondered because uh, the move speed on it is flattened. Um, now, as far as solo queue is concerned, people were already maxing E last. Uh, so in that case, it's just a strict buff anyway because you're not getting level 17 on Bard ever. So, okay, fair enough there. Uh, next up, minor hits to Diana, who's slightly overpowered now, so slightly slower Q. Um, had some kind of weird mana scaling on the W, where rank 2 cost a lot more than it was flattened from there. Uh, now it's going the full way. Um, also, there's a bug fix on R having a reset, so um, here's the mana cost. First nine levels of the same ability. Um, and then at level 10, we hit rank 3, it's got a higher mana cost. This should be red, not green. Uh, this gets pretty expensive, your W. So keep that in mind. High levels of Diana are going to have pretty high mana costs. Next up, a big set of changes to Galio. And I'm not sure these are actually buffs. Uh, this seems to be said as though it's going to make Galio better. I'm not sure it's going to. Okay, so mana growth is up by 20 is, is not trivial. Um, also, the passive damage is up uh, from 12 to 80 plus attack damage uh, to 15 to 160 plus attack damage. Also, the bonus MR ratio is 0.2 higher. Now, keep in mind, you're going to buy like... 100 bonus MR and get 20 extra damage. So like you look at these numbers and 20 extra damage from the MR buff is not that big of a deal. But here's the mana before and after. Uh, now he has really, really, really high mana growth. 1180 is a very high mana pool. Um, so he's got a crap ton of mana now. Holy moly. Um, but also passive damage. And it counts your total AD again, keep in mind. So that's part of the slam. But um, up three in the early game, up 80 in the late game. I mean, definitely matters. Uh, again, you can gain like 20 more through the MR buff, whatever, but it's not that big of a deal. Like you can have Abyssal Mask and Banshee's Veil, and it's like 30 at most. Um, it's actually going to be less than that, but, you know, again, whatever. So your passive is more damage, your mana pool is higher, that's kind of nice. 
Um, so that's those. The cooldown is uh, shortened to five seconds, but isn't reset um, on hitting spells. So I don't know. I actually am okay with this. I think this is fine. It's just now it's kind of more reliable to use for wave clear. You can kind of play around it a bit more easily. Um, you don't have quite that same all-in power, but... Um, Right, of like, you know, coming in, landing your spells, throwing your buttons out, and then um, landing your passive again. Like, sometimes those were combos you could have. You don't have that anymore, but whatever. Um, next up, Q cooldown is getting extended by 4 to 2 seconds. The damage is going up by 10. The mana cost is going down by 0 to 20. So here's all your Q changes. Um, again, the cooldown is up 40 to 25%. Uh, the damage is up much less than that. The cost is down a little bit. So he's got absurd mana pool at this point, right? He's got he's got insane mana. Um, his stuff is cheaper. His stuff does more damage. His passive does more damage. It just can't spam as much. But he's got more mana anyway, and he can't spam. So, like, he's never running out of mana? Okay, whatever. So, um, okay, cool. You have infinite mana. Your wave clear. I guess if you needed the cooldown to clear the wave, if you needed to get a second Q out to clear the wave, that's going away a little bit. So that's going to be relevant, but... Um, whatever. Uh, then the final thing is you can no longer flash while channeling W. It actually gets interrupted by CC, but you're not self-slowed as much. And that's a really, really, really big change. Um, so he's not, you know, quite the unstoppable juggernaut that he was before. To be fair, not being able to flash the W means if you got stunned... While channeling W, you weren't going to catch people anyway, so it doesn't really matter. But it means that, like, Caster can queue you and turn your W off, or you can get silenced by something. So, you know, there's there's some interesting parts to it. But um, ultimately, I kind of have a hard time considering all this buffs. Like, this is probably a strict buff to Q, honestly. And this is arguably a strict buff to the passive, and this is a strict buff to his mana. But, like... I don't, I don't know. It, it's weird. I'm actually pretty sure this champion does gain win rate, actually. Um, this certainly pushes Galio away from pro play, and then he'll get, like, power added back up. And it's going to have to happen, because Galio's not seen anywhere right now. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it, it's weird, because, like, again, I actually think these are all, like, these are all buffs, in my opinion. And you lost, you lost these two things. Um, so maybe it is a win right plus in solo queue. Maybe it really is, but I don't know. It still feels weird in, for some reason. Next up, strict buffs to Jin. Two seconds off the cooldown. Quarter second on the root duration. There you go. 14% lower cooldown. One seventh to um, one third more CC. That's nice. Uh, big changes to Lux. Light Binding once again has a cooldown incentive, but you don't get punished for ranking it up on mana cost. So there's this. Um, obviously, you're not going to max Q last anymore. Uh, you probably max Q first or second nowadays for support. In solo Q, it's probably second now. Um, optimal play in solo Q is actually maxing W second, even in mid lane because the shield was so good. That might be going away. Uh, but I think you have to max Lux Q second Probably across all roles at this point. Maybe first, but I doubt it. Prismatic Barrier getting hit pretty hard. Um, no longer gets 53% um, more shielding. Uh, just straight up, it's just two-thirds as good. The AP ratio is the same, but the actual flat shielding is two-thirds as good. Duration down slightly. Okay, whatever. Um, and then the R cooldown, instead of being 80 to 50, is 80 to 40, but you don't get the refresh. You don't get the refresh off of getting a kill or assist off this within the first second and three quarters, which means if you were going to get a refresh, it is far worse on cooldown. If you were not going to get it, it's as good or better. The AP ratio is one third higher. It goes from three quarters of an ability power to one ability power for a point of damage. Um, or one, yeah, it's, it's getting better. Um, uh, and otherwise, yeah, um, I mean, these are big Lux nerfs, honestly. Um, th these these really can't be considered pretty much anything other than Lux nerfs. Um, this is going to push her very far down the support tier list. Um, like, this is a big enough change where pros would be like, I think Lux is dead, and they'll just stop picking her. Um, 
yeah, like this is the anti-Karma change where Karma got buffed, the buffs all got reverted or mostly got reverted, and Karma's 100% pick ban. This is Lux gets hit pretty hard, and she's probably gone from pro play. Um, I think her solo queue win rates are both pretty high, so she, just, she deserves strict nerfs. She will probably still be above 50% win rate in both roles. Next up, changes to Malphite. Uh, the Q is more intense but shorter. The W has a big hit on the first attack and then does cone damage instead of circle damage afterwards. Um, this probably adds a lot of reliability, but it is less damage. Um, so here is Malphite. And what I did here is I basically multiplied the, the haste and the slow, which is identical. I multiplied it by the duration and gave a like total CC score. So it was this, now it's this. Um, actual early ranks of the ability are more intense, but less total crowd control. Now, as always, I will bring this up every single time, slows do not stack at all in League of Legends. The game only ever takes the single highest slow, which means when you have a 14% to 26% slow, very frequently the slow is overwritten by someone else's slow and the ability does literally nothing. Things like Righteous Glory, things like Randuin's Omen, all this kind of stuff. Very frequently, it is easy for the slow to be overwritten. Now, I'm not saying 35 is absurdly high or anything, but it is easier for 35% CC to matter than it is for 26 to matter. So there's always that subtle piece afterwards. Um, regardless, it is definitely, I would say, a nerf in the early game. Also worth pointing out, diminishing returns is a thing. Um, the farther you go either high or low from sort of base movement speed, the, the less it actually moves. Um, and so with more intense slows and more intense hastes in the real world, you actually aren't getting as much push as the numbers would tell you. You would actually, in those cases, want long duration, lower intensity instead of high intensity, lower duration. Um, that said, you will still have three seconds of closing the freaking gap really quickly instead of four seconds of closing it a bit more slowly. Um, so, like, for three seconds, it is better crowd control, and then for the last second, it is worse crowd control. But it should still be enough to close the gap with your opponent to get your jungler into range to land crowd control. Um, that even if the total units of, of distance moved is lower, this still might mean more in a real game of League of Legends. The next thing is the W damage. Uh, w seems to be maxed last. It scales off of your armor. Ultimately, the, the cone damage was cut by one full third. The armor ratio and the base damage were cut by a third. The AP ratio, I believe, was unchanged. Um, a mana cost is also added, by the way, so there's now a more expensive mana cost in the ability. So these all feel like nerfs, um, but I do want to point out that this first hit certainly does matter. It reaches because of the bonus range. It does bonus damage. Um, this is more damage than the old W would deal. So um, in general, I'm going to say that because um, a cone AoE is going to probably be more reliable and do more damage and arguably do better wave clearing... Um, because this first hit is going to do more damage than before. I'm not going to strictly consider W change as a nerf. Um, the Q is really, really close. It spawning in front of him is a positive. It's going to hit his target more quickly. It's going to be harder to spell shield. It's going to, you're going to get your buff sooner. Um, also want to point out that Malphite's size growing with armor means his auto attack range goes up, which means this gets more reliable as well. Um, I don't know if it's going to increase his E AoE or his R AoE. It might. I don't know for sure. It will increase the Q range because it comes out from in front of him. So he is going to have some like usability buffs as a result. Um, and ultimately, even if these aren't buffs, and even if they are nerfs, Malphite is a high win rate champion. He's actually above 50, so I think it's actually okay-ish. Uh, even if his power does go down slightly, these all seem to be sort of some level of feel changes. Uh, next up, small nerfs for Mordekaiser, uh, less magic pen, a little bit less best base damage in the passive. It's K. No longer works on his corpse, that's probably a good thing as well. Um, literally getting 10 damage on her E uh, for earlier, um, slightly better early jungle clearing, that's kind of nice. Uh, Phantom Undertone not only stuns things that it hits, even though it doesn't damage non-champions, I think that's a good thing. Um, R now does not chunk things it doesn't kill nearly as hard, that's a pretty big deal. Um, also, now he basically gets two versions of your cut. Either gives two to himself, or gives himself one and his ally one. 
Uh, so basically, Pike gets richer as a champion. That's sort of like how they're adding power back to Pike now that Pike is slightly underpowered via the last patch's nerfs. Uh, they're just giving Pike more gold, but he's going to chunk people less, but he's going to stun minions. Okay. Next up, changes to Rise. Not quite rear, but small buffs. More health regen is basically the only numbers change. So here's that. Pretty meaningful, actually. It's pretty meaningful health regen. Cool stuff. Uh, I actually, so I know there's a lot of Singe players who really liked having the um, one pixel poison trail where you'd like bind regular cast and smart cast to the same button. And then you'd tap poison trail and you'd turn it off instantly. And people couldn't see your poison. And you felt really smart. Um, I'll be honest, I'm glad that's gone. And I like, I'm a, I consider myself a Singed aficionado. I really, really like Singed. If you make me play a top lane game for my life, I'd probably pick Singed. Um, really like the champion. Uh, so this is, this is me being not biased as like, I hate Singed player because I love Singed. Um, but I'm actually glad this is gone, honestly. I think I think just, like, jank is not something you want to keep in your game. Um, and that's janky. Uh, what it also does is it helps bad Singed players play a little bit better. You won't turn off Q on accident as often, which I think is also a positive. You can mash Q and, oh, okay, it's on. You won't turn it off quite as quickly. I think it's a good thing. Um, the highlight being better is also a good thing, of course. Always good to have extra UI benefits for things like toggles. Um, next up is a sort of small rework to Swain. Okay, basically the way it works is you don't store five soul fragments. Soul fragments permanently restore health and restore mana. Um, that's a pretty big deal. So let's go with the health change, the health change, and compare it to soul fragments. It takes between zero and 17 fragments over the course of the entire game to keep up in health. This is going to happen. In most cases, this strictly is a buff. The health changes, I think, are a strict buff to Swain. Okay, next topic. Um, collecting a Soul Fragment restores mana instead of restoring mana on Q-Kill. That's probably a nerf. Um, yes, you're going to collect Soul Fragments over time, sure. And yes, it's certainly more than you're getting from last hitting minions. But, like, I'm pretty sure that you kill minions with Q more than twice as often as you land a W or E. So, this mana thing, I would say, is a nerf. What is cool, though, is the bolts now always go through minions. So, this means you can, actually poke, you can actually poke champions with it now, which means you can E, pull someone in, and actually land Q on them. Now, that's relevant. That is definitely relevant. Now, you're, gonna not, you're not going to multi-hit very well because uh, the angle is wider now. Um, but, to be fair, you're going to partially wave through, right? Your E is going to go through minions the first time around. You're going to queue. It's going to hit all the minions as well. It's going to hit the champion that you pulled in. Um, this is a very, very big flow change. This is really hard to properly know just how good it's going to be. Because you now have reliable wave clear, even if you don't have the insane mana pool for it. Um, also worth pointing out, the range went down. Um, this range went down. Um, and the cooldown went up on Q. Here is the Q clan of before and after. Certainly substantially higher. This is relevant. I personally would have liked to see it just be 8 to 4. Just to have flatter numbers. It doesn't really matter. But like, I like seeing not decimals. Not that important. But my opinion. Um, regardless, whatever. This is going to fan out much more. Uh, next up. R has a mana cost. But... You can cast it without picking up Soul Fragment since your last ultimate, which is generally, I would say, a positive. Um, okay, let's talk about the things that have changed here. The bonus health that it gives you on Transform is lower, but scales with Soul Fragment. It also drains everything, but you get half the health that you did before from minions and monsters. But if you hit twice as many minions and monsters, and spoiler alert, you will... Um, it's a buff. Also, it hits all champions instead of, like, what, only three targets or something like that? So here's how much health it gives you. Instead of 150 to 400, it's 125 to 275, which is a reduction. But if you can get 25 soul fragments by the end of the game, or 5 by level 6, which seems doable, it's a buff. Which means Swain is, once again, tankier as a champion. He has lost range, he has gained durability, and by the way, keep in mind... He's already getting the extra health from this change. He's getting it again from this change. He's also healing, I would argue, more by draining more units. And now here's the other half of the changes to Swain. 
The R can be instant cast. You no longer must drain a bunch of health before you can cast R2. You can instant cast R2 for this much damage. So that's a buff. Strictly a buff. Number two. You no longer need five soul fragments to do max demon flare damage. Instead, you just have to drain enough health. Okay. Well, let's start with... Let's start with the best case scenario in both cases. What if you could drain all the health you needed, drain all the health you needed, and you had five soul fragments? Then what was it? Okay, well, the old max damage based on soul fragments was 225 to 375 based on soul fragments held with a total AP ratio with all five soul fragments of 1.05. Max damage is now... 2 to 400, which is 25 less the same, 25 more, so basically the same number, with a 1.0 AP ratio, which is almost identical as well. <clears throat> okay, so the max damage in the best possible case is the same. Wait, one more thing. Keep in mind, you could not cast R2 at all until you drained 125, 300, or 450 health. It was uncastable until then. Well, not only could you already cast if you needed to, but... You had to do this to get max damage. Now you have to do this to get max damage. Requires slightly more health drain in the early game. Requires less health drain in the mid game. And a lot less health, race, health drain in the end game. So late game Swain always does more damage. Doesn't need five soul flare fragments, or um, soul fragments in general, and can recast the ultimate far earlier. So late game Swain is definitively a better mage. In addition to this, you are never screwed by not getting enough drain in time. You can always recast R early when you might have never been able to cast it before. In general, this is always a buff to R. This is basically always a buff to R. This is always a buff to his health. This is debatable on the queue. In general, I'm expecting Swain buffs as a result. That's the change. Next up, changes to Silas. He does roughly double the damage from his passive to minions that he did before. He is gaining 525 damage and point to ability power on his Q. He is getting a flattened cooldown on the E with a shorter stun duration, but holy moly is immune to magic damage for two seconds. Wow. That's a big change. That's a big change. Hijack's range goes down. You can hold your ult for 30 less seconds. And there's a real cooldown at rank 3. This is the other biggest single change to the kit. Holy moly, what a gigantic change. Also worth noting, um, a more friendly... Um, AP ratio to AD conversion, right? Instead of half your ability power becomes one attack damage, 0.4 ability power becomes one attack damage. Instead of 0.7 becoming total AD, 0.6 becomes total AD. So um, buffs there. So here is Silas Q damage before and after. Base damage up to 6 to 9%. AP ratio up 20%. Here's the E cooldown. You're obviously going to max it last forever. And you should max it last in the previous patch as well. So really big buff there. And here is the R cooldown. Yep, 400%. You no longer get two or three Silas ults in a team fight. That is, of course, a really, really, really big deal. Next up, Tom Kench. Abilities no longer deal bonus damage based on passive stacks. And they no longer deal 1% per stack. It's only 2.5 flat. It's only on auto attacks. It doesn't stack up, and it doesn't stack from Q. This is definitively a nerf to the passive's damage output. Q has a longer cooldown again. No longer has the wide hitbox arc. Um, stunning someone with Tongue Lash removes the passive stacks. You cannot stun into Devour. 
It doesn't affect how damage works, because again, you don't stack up to do damage. It's simply, if you stun, you can't devour, not without auto, auto, auto. And getting three autos off in two seconds is going to be hard to do. Keep in mind, you do not stack stacks with the Q, which means you have to auto, 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 Q, auto, auto, auto to get a devour after a stun. Good luck doing that ever. The slow is overall weaker, but has a longer duration. Worse cooldown, better stun duration. Wow, these are big changes to Tom Kench. Generally speaking, these are all nerfs. Um, next up, though, Devour is slightly less aggressive, no longer near no longer stunned. Uh, damage output is flattened. I want to point out that uh, Tom Kench was maxing W second and E last across all his roles in solo queue. This flattens your desire to rank up W because the damage doesn't go up nearly as quickly. You can devour red and blue, though, which is kind of cool. Um, but now the E rank of incentive has gone up. Um, this is a bigger upgrade than this. Um, this, though, is a bigger upgrade than this, so, hey, it's debatable. Anyway, here's the numbers on how Tom Kench E works now. If all you cared about was the thick skin shield, you used to get 80 to 100% of the damage you took as a shield, assuming you could absorb it all. Now you get 45 to 65% of the damage you took as a shield. So it is half to two-thirds as good. Um, the rank up, though, is still better in terms of getting shields. Um, the rank up does matter for getting shield and going. As far as the regen is concerned, um, there was a really important regen incentive, or rank up incentive for the regen. You'd get 16 to 40% of the damage you took as regen. Now it's 34 to 49%. So if you're taking damage and withstanding it, there is less rank up incentive. Uh, but it is more than twice as good in the early game. Um, so that is up to you, which kind of thing you want more out of. But essentially, he is less tanky against burst, as long as you can put the shield up. He is a lot more resilient against poke, and pretty substantially so. Hard to say if it's a buff or a nerf. Different things going on. More recast toggle consistency towards Urgot. Here is some Yumi nerfs, uh, getting a, a 30 to 0 shielding off the passive. And no longer restores mana at all. Big nerf to the passive here. Prowling Projectile is losing 10 flat damage, but gaining 0 0.05 ability power. And it's going to cost 15 more mana. Here is the Yumi Q. It takes 200 AP to make up the 10 damage. It's reasonable for Yumi to get 200 AP by mid to late game. Through her W, through her Athenes, through her spell item. It's going to happen at some point. Um, that's fine, but the cost is quite a bit higher. And a flat 15 higher mana cost really affects her early game. Keep in mind, it's mana cost up and mana restore is gone. This is a very big hit to Yumi's early laning. Very big hit to Yumi's early laning, but late game power is up. This is a hit to her early laning. Late game power is the same. Next up, the base heal is now up to 2.3x instead of 2x. On low health targets, the AP ratio, though, still 3x as well. So she is better at keeping people alive. The ability is actually cheaper as well. So what she lost in poke, she might have gained in sustain. Every two every um, two Qs is made up for by every single E you cast. Less pokey, better sustain. I think that's probably a positive direction for, for Yumi. Because she is a pretty absurd poke mage. Next up, there are three different auto-attack heavy top laners that are getting their early attack damage and overall auto-attack DPS stats cut in the early game, and some of that push towards late game power. So Jace loses four attack damage, gains some attack damage scaling, and gets Shock Blast reshaped. Attack damage is higher by level 8, Shock Blast damage is higher by level 9, the AD, the, um, AD ratio makes up for the nerfs, well it doesn't make up for the nerfs in the early game, it's really not possible to get this much attack damage early game, people don't usually recall at 25 AD at 6, maybe you can, but whatever, it's how much AD it takes regardless, um, but definitively weaker in the early game, um, and then by around level 7, your shock blast has the same damage but a higher ratio, your AD is basically identical, and it goes up from there. So Jace has a better late game, he has 7% more total attack damage at level 18, uh, his Shock Blast was 3% more total damage at rank 6, and has a 20% higher AD ratio at all times. But, really substantial early game nerfs. His Q does an auto attack's worth of damage in the early game. That's a really meaningful change. We'll see how it goes. 
Next up is Kennen, also losing attack damage, also getting attack damage growth, also losing a bunch of base attack speed. Kennen, for the longest time, had the highest base attack speed in the game. It never went away. I don't know why. Finally, it did. He's now regular champion base attack speed, 0.625. As small compensation, though it's not good enough, Lightning Rush has 10% more attack speed on it. Here's the attack damage before and after. Once again, by level 8, it's higher, but weaker to, you know, 3-ish attack damage in the early game. Two and a half goes down. Attacks per second before and after, just from stats scaling, still scales up to about one attack per second. Still pretty reasonable. Keep in mind that the attack speed uh, growth didn't go anywhere. Just the base attack speed went down by 9%. Still reasonably quick, though. And then with Lightning Rush turned on, assuming you max the ability last, which is what most people do, you close most of the gap. It gets really close, but it's not quite there. In general, this would be a nerf to um, Kennen. And in fact, one thing I didn't do, because I have a small brain, um, even though the attack damage on the ability on the character is higher, the fact that you attack less often means the auto attack DPS is always lower. I didn't think about that. I didn't put that number. Regardless, it's weaker. AD Kennen definitively got nerfed. Now, I would say most Kennens are AP Kennen anyway. Um, and it's not that important. Like, these don't mean as much, but... Still matters, still relevant, does do a thing. Next up, Nico getting a similar treatment, going down to 48 attack damage. Chase went down to 54. Um, going down to 48 attack damage, but attack damage growth is up. Attack speed base is down, but actually has some attack speed growth. Here is Nico. Actually falls down longer, falls down more and for longer. Catches up at attack damage at level 10, actually. Um, her attacks per second um, actually does eventually go up more by the late game. Actually, the equilibrium is kind of funny because it's at the same point in time. Um, first end levels, left end levels for the same at the same time, but back to a 0.625 regular normal champion, not auto attacker, base attack speed. But because she does gain attack speed per level going up here, if you aren't playing, and this by the way, this is a good thing. So so I like when you have changes like this because if you aren't playing attack speed Nico, she actually attacks faster than she did before, which means her W can be a bigger part of AP Nico's kit. Because by the end game, she's naturally gaining this. If you are playing attack speed Nico, keep in mind that you're fighting against all these extra bonus stats you were getting and a lower base attack speed ratio. So this still hurts attack speed Nico. All in all, and then also she gains um, less move speed off of using the W when you, you get your third auto attack off. Whatever. Um, all in all, I like these changes. Even if Jace, Kennen, and Nico aren't supreme top tier top lane picks in pro play, they are certainly around, they're certainly valuable, they're certainly good. Um, I like this change because it lowers the frustration in solo queue. Even if they're not absurd in pro play, and they're not, they're definitely around, but they're not absurd. Um, They'll be a bit less frustrating in landing phase, and that's a good thing. All right. 48 minutes into the video. It's time for the TLDR patch 9.14. Blitzcrank, Ult, and Renekton Power W break shields before dealing damage. They're good against things like Janna and Driven. Katarina's Ult got better, and Kled's Q gained healing reduction, which puts them good against healers. Fizz and Leona now uh, have their abilities work against all abilities as flat damage reduction pre-mitigation. Um, which means that they're going to be really good against things like Kaisa Q and Malzahar E and Rageblade champions in general. That's going to be really interesting. Karma, LeBlanc, and Morgana now reveal their stealth targets after the CC lands. That's a big deal. Ari Charm stops dashes, Cassie P is W, now has no minimum range, so she can cast it at her face against champions like Zed who might want to ult her. Pretty big stuff there. Overall reshaping is going to make um, Cassie P a weaker in the early game, stronger in the late game. Poppy W now grounds uh, champions and slows them after knocking them up out of their dashes. Aatrox gains a bunch more health regen and can no longer revive. Akali gains a lot more durability. A lot higher AP ratios, loses a lot of W duration, and no longer hides from champion abilities that reveal. Cooldown's better, energy restores better, meaning max W last. E does a lot more damage and has a very big AP ratio on it. Akali does more damage, 
is more durable, is less tricky. Alistair has more mana. Aurelian's soul, big stun, is bigger. Overall has more move speed out of combat as well, which is quite nice. Bard has more health, less health regen, averages out at about a minute and a half. A magical journey is better and flattened, so you're going to keep maxing W second, and E is a better 1.1. This will end up being Bard buffs. Small nerfs to Diana Q missile speed, small nerfs to Diana W mana cost. Galio gains a crap ton of mana, a lot of passive damage, a fair bit of Q damage, a fair bit of Q cost buffs, by the way. Worst Q cooldown, cannot flash during W anymore, can be stunned out of W, but doesn't self-slow as hard. Overall, probably buffs to Galio, but flash W going away is going to be weird. Better cooldown, better root duration on W is Jin buffs. Lux has to max Q second because she no longer has a flat cooldown on Q. W got really hurt on its shielding overall. That's going to be a really big thing. It's probably going to push her out of pro play. Final Spark lost its cooldown reset, but got a slightly better cooldown and a better AP ratio overall. This helps mid Lux be a little bit better. And overall, it's going to be kind of close to power neutral because you weren't always getting resets. Malphite has a more intense haste and slow on the Q. The model grows with armor size, which should make his ranges go up. And W now hits in a cone instead of a circle, which is a big bump in reliability, but the damage is down. The first hit is more damage, that'll be kind of interesting. Mordekaiser gets slightly less damage on the passive, slightly less magic pen on the E. Nidalee, slightly better clear speed with getting 10 flat damage on the E. Pike now stuns non-champions it hits, doesn't chunk champions it can't quite kill, and gets more gold overall, which is going to be probably a slight buff to the champion. Rise gets a bit more health regen. Singe can't toggle off his Q as fast. Swain is going to end up having more health because um, Soul Fragments now stack permanently and are worth 5 health each. They also restore mana instead of your Q restoring mana. Uh, the Q cooldown is worse, the Q range is worse, the Q fans out more aggressively, but they always continue through minions. So you have bigger mana constraints, but arguably better wave clear. You also will always hit champions you yank with your E because the Q will pass through the minions. It's a very, very big reshape to how he lanes. The ultimate is overall a lot of changes, more reliable, more damage in more cases, and arguably a stronger ability. So Swain lost some ranges, lost some mana restore, got more health, got more reliability, got more damage. It's going to be interesting to see how this plays out. Silas does more damage to minions again. His Q does more damage overall. His E shields against all magic damage for two seconds. That's absurd. Better cooldown, worse stun. Hijack, lower range, can't hold spells as long. Has a real cooldown at rank three. That is massive. Tom Kench no longer stacks his passive on abilities. No longer deals bonus damage on multiple stacks. Q cooldown is longer. Q, when it stuns, removes all stacks of acquired taste, so you can't stun a devour. You have to auto-attack three times, then stun, then auto-attack three times, then devour. Or auto-attack, Q slow, auto-attack, auto-attack, devour, spit them out, auto-attack, Q slow. Slow duration being three seconds, but you could definitely auto-attack, Q, auto, auto. You could probably actually just Q, auto, 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 devour, but whatever. Um... W damage and rank up is flattened. E essentially gives you better regen, less shielding. That's the difference. Urgot minor thing here. Yumi no longer restores mana at all. Shielding worse in the early game. Q damage down by a flat 10. Mana cost up by a flat 15. She's weaker in the early game. Have you heard that yet? But Zumi's costs a lot less mana and has better missing health scaling. So she is a better sustained support a worse poke support. Range top laners, Jace, Kennen, and Nico all lost early game attack damage, gained late game attack damage, and either lost early game and gained late game spell damage, or lost early game and late game attack speed, or lost early game and gained late game attack speed. Ultimately, they're all weaker early game, arguably stronger later. That's it for the patch rundown. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. Bye.